Yeah, no, no, I just passed it. <laughs> yeah, it is quite beautiful. Yeah, what is it? How do you pronounce it? Ganymede? No, <laughs> I think it's Ganymede. Yeah, no, uh, just saw uh, Earth just sent their Jupiter spacecraft right past it. Yeah, first time they've been this close in 20 years. <laughs> yeah, no, if you look close, uh, yeah, no, totally. If you look close, you can see a lot of amazing, amazing artifacts from the history of this moon, which is larger than any other moon in the solar system. It's pretty incredible. It's larger than uh, one of the planets, in fact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, are you looking at my screen? Yeah, look down in the bottom, relative bottom of the planet, uh, of the moon there. Yeah, you can see this large impact forming the telltale sign of ejecta moving out in all directions there. You can see each one, I mean, this is a, this is, it's a big moon. It's not a, it's not a space station, but it's, a, I mean, it is a big moon. I mean, each one of those pixels that you're seeing on Ganymede right there, first time we've seen it in uh, 20 years, each one of those pixels is about a kilometer across. Yeah, no, do you know what's even more, do you know what's even, underneath all that, uh, all that argent crust you're seeing there is an ocean we suspect that is 900 kilometers deep. I know. Can you, what's that? No, I don't think Jeff Bezos is going to make it all the way out here. <laughs> I know, it does kind of look like his head. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm, I mean, hey, good on him for being, uh, for volunteering to be one of the first ones on the ship, but I don't really care too much about that. Do you know what I care about? Bugs. Welcome to office hours. What? Oh, no, I'm talking to a bunch of people. Bye. I'll be right back. Whew! Man, that spaceship lands fast. Hello, and welcome to Office Hours, the live component of the facility where good old Professor Kyle sends you through some sort of digital wormhole and he allows all of you, my lovely staff, facility members, and members of you, the general public, to ask me any old science-y, pop culture-y, physics-y, engineer-y, hair care kind of question. And I will do my very best for the next hour or so to educate and entertain you. Of course, on every episode of Office Hours, in between taking all your comments and questions, we'll be talking about a number of topics, as we are wont to do on this show. We'll be talking about cicadas. One of my favorite insects. I don't know why. We'll get into it. We'll also be doing... Uh, we'll be talking about the last episode of the facility, where that was like two weeks ago, because I've been a little bit busy. We'll be talking about Fermi estimations. Maybe we can do this one in uh, real time with y'all, and uh, in the meantime, if you really, really do want me to see something, you can engage with me on YouTube live right now. Please be respectful of our security team. If you're spamming, if you're putting all caps, if you're saying weird stuff, you will just be banned. We don't care. Uh, <laughs> but if you really, really, really want me to see something, you can try Super Chat as you're seeing all these lovely facility patrons trying. Chris Sparks with a million pesos! Trying to flex on you with a million pesos, Chris Sparks, every week coming in like a maniac, Elizabeth Calvert, with the 50, hey, hey, science, Kyle, I think that's redundant. My question of the week is from my mom, how do we explain its biology when it comes to gender, sex, and sexuality who people don't understand the science behind it? Well, obviously, it's a very complicated question, Elizabeth, but to put it very simply, um, biological sex has to do with your physiology, your anatomy, uh, what hormones are coursing through your veins, what your genetics say, and something like uh, gender is more of a social construct. It's something that is agreed upon uh, knowing all the ins and outs of, of your biology that you were born with, but, uh, it's not always a binary thing in many Western cultures. It's, it's a binary thing, but, uh, in many non-Western cultures, it's a quaternary thing or a quad. There's a lot of them. So, uh, in terms of the science there, you have to be very specific because some of it is not, there's not a science to it. There's more of an art and an expression to it. Station of Play with the 20 says, Hey Kyle, love the show. My mods were really worried about me answering that question, so I think I think I nailed it. Uh, Station of Play with the 20 says, Hey Kyle, love the show. Hey, thanks for typing that so I can read it. How do you feel about the combination of scientific accuracy and science fiction elements of the Futurama series? I've always found it interesting. Well, what's even more interesting is that a lot of the people who write Futurama and write... Uh, 
the Simpsons have mathematics PhDs, and uh, they're very, very smart people. So it's no accident that um, the Simpsons, Futurama, and the like are filled to the brim with sciencey things. And it's always, it's always fun. And if you're a, a mega nerd like me, whenever they bring up something like that, it's just that it's, it's still funny, which is the most important part. It's still funny, but there's always a little bit uh, to learn there if you're looking hard enough, which is kind of how we make our shows here at the facility. Laser Cow with the 10 says, Hey Kyle, how's your day? I just want to ask you what specifically is Hawking radiation? You got an answer, bro, bro. They didn't say bro, bro. Um, I'm doing all right. I'm feeling a little jittery. Um, a little tired. That's why I have game fuel. It's victory in a can. I drink game fuel. Because I wanted to try it. Um, I'm tired. I'm real tired. Last week, uh, last week, what did we do? We flew to New York and we saw something that you can't see anywhere else in the world and we made a video about it. It should be pretty cool. Um, but Hawking radiation is the radiation that is supposed to be emitted by black holes as it goes through its life cycle. Um, Stephen Hawking, what he's really famous for is postulating that ev uh, eventually black holes evaporate. How? Well, at the boundary, at, at the event horizon of a black hole, suppose in your mind that uh, two particles pop into existence, as we know can happen. A, a particle and antiparticle, uh, virtual particles, pop into existence. But one pops in on one side of the boundary, and one pops in on the other. And because it's on the inside of a black hole, it can never return. But because these particles are intertwined, so to speak, um, with their masses, if one is on the outside of the boundary and it can escape, but one never returns, that means the one that escapes, because it's intertwined now, its lifetime is, its life cycle, again, so to speak, to use a uh, biological illusion there, um, because it's now intertwined with the mass of the black hole, that mass that's escaping will reduce the mass of the black hole. It has to. And uh, this reduction of mass by emitting particles away from itself is what Hawking radiation is. And it calculates that over time, uh, black holes will eventually lose all their mass in this way and evaporate. And... But the rate is so slow because it's based on mass and radius and that kind of thing. And uh, black holes are very, very heavy. Um... The timelines on some of these things are like trillions of years. Uh, J Potter 14 with the 50 says, I've got nothing important to say, just simping for science. Whew. Classy. J Evergreen with the Australian $40. Uh, hey Kyle, your thoughts on your thoughts on Hans Asperger and we saw your <laughs> and <laughs> what are your thoughts on Hans Asperger? And also we saw your hot girl post over the weekend. I'm wondering if you've explored your gender at all. <laughs> Love the show. Hope you're doing well. Well, Pride Month is fun for these questions. Uh, I'm straight. It is about how much I've, I've looked into it. Um, and, uh, you know what? There's some, uh, there's some complicated... <laughs> Oh, do you know what's easier than talking about this? Bugs. Come on now. Don't make me say things about myself. I don't want to... Anyway. Cicadas. Cicadas are... Uh, I'm, I'm unabashedly a love... Yeah, people are like, what is going on? Yeah. Um, I am unabashedly in love with a cicada. For whatever reason, they are my favorite insect. Or one of my favorite insects. I think it has something to do with how cool their their little face is. And it looks like they're wearing like a, a mask that Scorpion would wear. Uh, that Scorpion would wear in Mortal Kombat. But uh, another reason... I love them so much is because they've been baked into my childhood. Their, their song, their chorus was some sort of soundtrack to my childhood. So when I hear cicadas, when I hear the sound of cicadas, the cacophony of carapace, feel free to use that one if you want to, 
when I hear that, um, it brings me right back to my childhood. And they're in the news because every so often, and that often is very specific, as we'll get into, every so often, because of the life cycle of these insects, broods of them emerge all at once in the billions and or maybe possibly this year, trillions. So you have trillions of insects emerging all at once. And they cover a lot of area of the United States. About 15 different states in the United States will see some sort of brood emergence eventually every... Um, as they go through their life cycle, which again is very specific, which we'll get into. Um, but because these insects emerge by the billions or trillions, they affect human life quite a bit. And like I said, um, their uh, cacophony of c carapace um, is something that I associate with my childhood. I like the sound. Reminds me of summertime. Um, but because there's so many of them, and we know this happens with other insects too, it does interfere with human life. These sounds are very loud. They can be very annoying to some people, as I see some of you are saying in the chat. Um, I should point out to everyone saying um, they're all creepy to me and I don't like them. Uh, they are completely harmless to people. Um, they're only here to, to, to do two things. To siphon some liquid from the stems of plants and have fun. They're here to reproduce. That's all they're going to do. They don't bite. They're not going to sting you. They're just here. Um, <laughs> uh, they're just here to make a lot of sound and, and party. Um, but because there's so many of them here to party, they can often get in our way. In fact, uh, just the other day, the Cincinnati PD reported that a car crashed into a pole because a cicada flew through the open window and hit the driver in the face. It's not funny. I think the driver's okay. But these bugs are everywhere when they emerge, and so there is some hazard, like, roll up your windows. Uh, one time I was hit in the face by, or, or in the chest by a hornet when I was driving, and then I had to prop myself up like that while I was driving so it didn't sting my butt. That was an interesting... Anyway, so there's a lot of these bugs flying around, and um, like I've been saying, these bugs are absolutely fascinating to me. And one of the most fascinating aspects, of course, is their sound and how much sound they can make. So when you hear a cicada's song, the first thing you should know is that this is the loudest song loudest sound that any insect produces, period. You may have heard katydids, you may have heard crickets, but up close, if you were to hold a cicada right up next to your ear, it would be like a rock concert. In fact, it would be painful. It's, it's I think, 105 to 107 decibels. So it'd be like putting highway construction right next to your, like a jackhammer right next to your ear. So these, these, these uh, insects are incredibly sonorous. Now, I bring up katydids and crickets because cicadas, to be this loud, they make sound in a different way. So here we are looking at some drawings, some old drawings um, of cicada. Lukey says, I love cicadas except when I'm on a motorbike. Whew. Yeah, I bet that would. Just a couple of grams moving at 70 miles an hour hitting you in the face. Yeah, it can, it, it can hurt. Anyway, so what makes a cicada so loud? Well, it is this, what you're seeing here. So here's the cicada. This is the underside. And this is what you'd see if you're looking right down on top of the cicada. The wings have been removed for your ease. <laughs> and what you're looking at here, if you're looking at the top, you have these little sections here on either side underneath the wings. These are these, and they are called timbles kind of like symbols. Now, these timbles are special organs that work in a different way than something like a cricket. You may know that crickets rub legs and wings together to make some sort of now, to make some sort of noise. But what cicadas do, their evolution has gone all in on making sound, which I think is fascinating, because these timbles 
there's not really it cicadas have evolved to be a musical instrument almost quite literally because these timbals are these folded sheets of protein folded on top of each other and how they make sound is that they use their entire bodies the muscles that run along their abdomen here they pull them and when they pull them they're pulling these protein folds apart and the act of pulling these very strong protein folds apart like an accordion creates a vibration creates air pressure from that vibration that creates the sound now i say cicadas have evolved to be more or less a musical instrument and that uh <laughs> What makes me say that is something that I learned just today. And I and I like these insects uh, quite a bit. And I'm just learning this uh, for the first time. Which is that C, figure C right there, or uh, C, that's, the, that's a shot of the abdomen from the inside. So most of this is hollow. You think this would be filled with squishy bug guts, but no, the squishy bug guts run along the outside edge, thin, in this out, thin outside edge. What's inside is an air chamber, and what that air chamber does is acts as some kind of um, area for resonance, like the inside of a guitar or a violin. And so when they're pulling their muscles and expanding these protein folds, all of that energy and all that vibration is also being amplified by their butts. And because they have butt amplifiers, cicadas are incredibly loud. I think that's incredible. Um, the other thing that makes cicadas so special is that they come out in the billions and or the trillions because they more or less come out all at once. Now, you've probably heard about, uh, you've probably heard what we call these things. We call these broods, and we call them uh, brood X or brood 13 or brood 11 or what have you, because the life cycle of a cicada is quite interesting. They spend the vast majority of their life underground as insects without wings. They look like little scarabs, little beetles. And they stay underground for like 15 to 17 years. So these insects live longer than pretty much any other insect. Incredibly long lifespans. And, and they spend those 15 to 17 years, or 13 to 17 years, just uh, sapping up juices from tree roots. And then, all at once, a single brood will emerge for a couple of weeks of having, having fun. Now, why do cicadas do this? If, you, if I were to ask you to describe a normal life cycle of some kind of creature, and don't, I'm, I'm still looking at all your comments and super chats. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to get them in my head, all right? But I got to talk about bugs for a second. If I asked you to describe the life cycle, life cycle of a general organism, you'd probably say, like, every year there's new bugs, right? Like most gestational cycles that you're familiar with are like a human's, like nine months, 12 months, whatever it is. Elephants are much longer, but you'd say, you know, for like a fly, every couple of weeks or months or however they live, there's a new one. But it's a very regular, it's, 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 a, it's a regular cycle that is like one, one like one month, each month or each year or each two years or whatever. Now, that kind of regularity in the life cycle of an organism means that predators, through evolution alone, they're not doing it willfully, it means that predators can evolve to have a similar life cycle and similar generational cycle. Ooh, kind of froze for a second there. That was weird and a similar generational cycle, such that new predators are born right when, uh, or uh, predators are reaching maturity right when their new prey items are born. And so evolution can, can uh, narrow th life cycles down such that predators and prey are being born 
at more or less the same time so the predators can have the most availability of their prey. Now here's the really, really cool part that I don't know off the top of my head if it happens in any or other organism. Brood 13, Brood 11, all these different broods, they emerge after so long and they emerge, it seems like, only after a prime number of years. Now let's think about that in the context of what I just said. A prime number of years. Do you know what a prime number is? A prime number is a number that can only divi be divided by one and itself. It doesn't have any other um, numbers like two, three, or five that you can divide into it and it would give you a nice whole number. So something like 13, you can't divide by any number except for 13 and one and get a nice whole number. Something like six, you could divide by two or three or six or one. So it's not a prime number. Now think about what we just said again. Predators try evolution trying to sync up predator life cycles with prey life cycles such that they can eat the most amount of them. Let's visualize that. So let's say, for example, predator A appears only every three years. And here's the, here's the years on the bottom axis here. Predator B appears every four years, or what have you. Look how hard it is, because there's no numbers that can be easily multiplied together. Remember, can't be divided out of. Um, yeah, something's going on here with my streaming service, but it's okay. Um, what was I saying? Because prime numbers cannot be reduced by like a factor of three or two or, or what have you, it's very hard to have regular cycles that would hit it. So look, predator A, if the cicadas are emerging once every seven years or 13 years or 17 years, the chance that they are going to sync up with a predator population is very low. Says my... Okay, I see I see something's going on here. Uh oh. Oh no. Oh no, something's happening. Let's try to get back. Uh oh. Hold on just a moment. So we can eliminate some of this, uh, some of this hitch in our giddy up here. Okay. I think we're, I think we're better here. <laughs> anyway. Um, so the secret of the cicada, a lot of it is that by being, by having these broods, that only come into being by the billions or trillions every every prime number of years we think we're not sure it's you can't really prove it oh man oh man yeah it's going cicadas are taking over my stream cicadas are taking over the stream oh no why is my encoder overloaded don't know i don't know but it's not great. Whatever's currently happening. Anyway. So you can't prove that they are... Uh, that that's the exact reason why this evolved. It's very hard to prove any evolutionary anything. But it's absolutely amazing to me that the loudest in insect on Earth is unknowingly taking advantage of mathematics to ensure that it survives and not just that's that's one evolution possible evolutionary adaptation there's another one um where another one could explain their huge emergence numbers that they just birth so many of them so that even with predators syncing up their lifespans or life cycles or generational cycles there's just too many of them there's just too many and they can't eat them all and so they survive that's one way through it huh just make enough babies that you can't eat all of us. 
And that's what I have to say about bugs. I, I gotta... Yeah. something Something's going on on the stream here. Uh, only been talking for 25 minutes. Hmm. Bear with me. Bear with me. Did this... I did this... When's the last time we streamed? Wasn't it fine? It's not going so hot. No. Something's... Something's bad. Something's bad. Bear with me. Faster and good. Bear with me. This is fun. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> uh, this is... Don't, I'll cut... I'll cut this out. Hmm. One second. One second. I got it. Kristen Wegner says, Kyle, love the show. Kyle, Kyle, love, love, love the show show. Happy Pride. Simping for Pride and allies from a polyamorous, pansexual, trans woman, unicorn swinger. <gasps> Who? That is... Sounds like a party. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Low latency? Is that what I want? Jay, is that what I want? Do I want low latency? This is fun, huh? Seeing this happen in real time. I bet it's fun. We have Thomas Hadrick with the 20. He says, Alexandrite is my favorite stone. They are ridiculously rare, vastly more so than diamonds, because beryllium itself is super rare. What's your favorite mineral element and why? Um, I like Fordite, which is a, uh, a big chunk of paint and layers of paint that were laid down in Ford automotive factories um, over a number of years. And automotive engineers working at Ford used to take them home and shine them and, and make them into jewelry for their wives. And it's also very rare because it's not produced anymore as, as they changed um, the painting process. Uh, Matt Creel 95 says, Hey, so did the one ring melt in the science lava? <laughs> you think that I spent many days out of my busy schedule seeing if the one ring would melt in actual lava. Well, you know what I have to say to that, Matt? Stay tuned for the video. Do I want... Uh, we have Nerdy Loki with the Australian $50. Says, Moni Kyle, at the point in time... <laughs> this is not an Australian accent. When humans colonize another planet, how many generations before Earth humans are classified as a different species to Mars humans? Well, having a different species is... Uh, is difficult. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, s one way we define uh, two different species is that whether or not that species can uh, interbreed anymore with, with a different species. And uh, so if you had two lion populations separated by some sort of climactic event, say they were separated by a rift in the earth caused by an earthquake. Over time, if their genetics diverged enough that those two populations could no longer interbreed, we would say, genetically, that they are no longer um, the same species. So, what I mean is, is that you'd have to have zero human genetic intermingling with Mars humans for a very long time. And, you know, you think humans aren't going to go party on, Mar you know, party on Mars? I think humans will be, inter if we become, okay, let's see what my security team has to say. If we become a multi-planet civilization, there'll probably be a lot of traveling between planets, right? So, oh, wait, yeah, what else do I have open here? There'll probably be a lot of, uh intermingling between planets because we can already travel between planets 
And uh, if that's the case... Oh, yeah, close that. What's that doing? Oh, okay. Okay. Let's close all this nonsense then. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry the stream today is butt. I'm trying my best here. But there's a lot of nonsense I have open. I don't remember this ever being such a, such of a problem. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> Maybe you have Chrome open? I have a lot of Chrome open. Is the issue. Okay, okay. Calm down. Calm down now. Calm down now. Um, so to have two different species on two different planets, I think they'd have to be... Human populations would have to be separated for a long, long time, and I just don't know if that's going to happen. Realistically. So I think... Are, are we good now? Are we good now? I think we got it? What if I move around? What if I move around? What if I try to sing? What if I do the dance? What if I do the thing? Great. <laughs> I just bought this Basilisk PC and that's... Kevin, why did we spend all that money if it can't have Discord open? First of all, how dare you? Second of all, you're cheap. I mean, where'd you get that haircut? Supercuts? Whoo! <laughs> okay. Wow. What a what a di what a day already that we're that we're having. So, uh, nerdy Loki, I hope that answers your question. Erica Schmidt with the twenty says alert from facility monitoring subprocess wimp. Oh, there's wimp interactions with Kevin Unit One Two Eight and Energy Conduit Eighty Three Bravo. Gosh darn it, son of a gun! <sighs> yeah, give me Kevin Unit One Two Eight. I don't know. Well, okay, fine. You can see your own comments if you really want to. Give me Kevin one two eight. Yeah, there's some. There's been some weakly interacting massive particles that are have been passing through his body. He's really concerned about it. What's that? Oh, he died. <laughs> oh, no well, problem solved. Yeah, I know they're weakly interacting. Just there was a lot of them. Oh man. Okay, so now that we're back on track, kind of, let's move on <laughs> to our next topic. Man. Jeez. Let's try this. On the last episode of the facility, we went through, which was two weeks ago, because I've been busy melting things in volcanoes, or not. Um, last episode of the facility, we talked about Fermi estimations, and this one weird math trick, scientists hate me, um, to estimate anything. And uh, this was named after Enrico Fermi, a legendary nuclear physicist and mathematician. And he was so, so good at estimating stuff back of the envelope, as they say, that they named the Fermi estimate after him. If you haven't seen the episode, please go back and watch it. But it's a fun, quick way to estimate basically anything with very little prior information. Estimate very technical things. Um, that you should have no business knowing off the top of your head. And we tried a couple of those at the facility, so go back and watch the episode if you haven't yet. But here's one I want to try with you in real time, just to, just to, just to flex our muscles a little bit. So flex our, flex our math muscles. I got a pen. I got some post-it notes. How many U.S. dollar bills does it take to equal the weight of a school bus? I now realize that I had a Chrome tab open with the answer to this that I didn't look at which is now closed. But I think I remember what the answer is. All right? So we're going to try this. Now, remember what we're going to do to get a... Um, what we're going to do to get an... Uh, oh, Esh Daddy with the 25 says, Kyle, I just want to take a second to thank you for discussing ASD, uh, autism spectrum disorder, and its impact on you. My son and I are on the spectrum and feel much better. And now we realize we, why we prefer Lego over people. Whew. I used to spend 
hours and hours with uh, just a Lego set in uh, my playroom as a kid. Like four hours alone just talking to myself. Good Lego set is magic. All right. How many U.S. dollar bills would it take to equal the weight of a school bus? So, like I said in the episode, we should start from a place of confidence. What do we know? Where do we want to go with our units? We want to do a dimensional analysis here. So we want to um, be starting with numbers that we have some kind of confidence in because as we make over and under estimations, we want them to basically cancel out so we narrow in on the right answer. So... I think where we start with something like this is what is the weight of a school bus? Now, I don't know if there's children in it, but um, I guess, because I know some things about some vehicles, I guess that some uh, that a, a large SUV... Remember, we can do order of magnitude stuff here, too. We don't have to be hyper-specific. So I'm going to say that one... Uh, one bus has the mass, I'm going to say it's about twice the mass of a large SUV, which I'm going to guess is four to 6,000 pounds. So let's say 10,000 pounds could be, could be eight, could be 15. I don't know. Could be a hundred. Well, see, that's, that's the next step of the framing process. Let's bound, make sure we're always bounding these numbers. Is a bus a hundred thousand pounds? I don't think so. And it's not. 1,000 pounds, so I'm going to go with 10, order of magnitude here, okay? So let's say it's 10,000 pounds, okay? One bus is 10,000 pounds. Dimensional analysis here. We're doing, this is the kind of live, stre live streaming content that, uh, that does super well next to uh, Fortnite and uh, Call of Duty Warzone. So, um... Now, how many U.S. dollars does it take to equal the weight of school bus? Now we have to estimate the mass of a single U.S. dollar. Okay. So how much does a dollar weigh? Well, I don't have a dollar on me because I don't carry cash anymore because I'm afraid of being mugged at all times, even though it's pretty much an irrational fear based on where I live. But I'm going to... But I know that a paperclip weighs about the mass of one gram and this feels this piece of paper feels pretty close to a paper clip ish um so when i feel a dollar bill bill y'all in my hand it can't be more than a few grams so i'm not going to say one i'm not going to be as specific as five let's say 10 grams okay so 10 grams Yes, I know I'm mixing up imperial and metric units. Blame my engineering degree. 10 grams for one dollar dollar bill, y'all. People are putting... That's about one gram, right? People are saying one gram, bus is like 12 tons. Okay, don't give me the answer. This is what it's... Back of the envelope or back of the post-it. That's what it's all about, baby. Okay. So now... I have I have units that could cancel out here. I have one bus over ten is ten thousand pounds, ten grams per dollar bill. So if I cancel out the units that I need to convert imperial and metric, I would get one bus per X amount of dollar bills, and that would answer our question. Now I think I remember what the answer to this is off the top of my head. So, um, how many grams are in a pound? Oh, I know, I know this. So uh, there's a thousand, so uh, make sure the units are canceling out. There's a thousand grams in one kilogram and one kilogram is 2.25 pounds. Okay. So now we have our dimensional analysis done such that uh, pounds cancels out with pounds, kilogram cancels out with kilogram, grams cancels out with grams, and what we should be left with is just buses per dollars. So now is the point where we could go to some sort of um, calculator. Couldn't think of the word calculator. Um, 
So on the top, let's, uh, yes. Okay. So 10,000 times 1,000. And maybe it's one gram. Does ten gram ten grams feels like a lot for a dollar? Maybe it's maybe it's one gram, right? Don't be talking about my gram grams like that. She's a nice lady. Hey, calm down. Uh, Umaro, thank you for updating everyone on the units that we're doing so far. Maybe that's more like one gram. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Now we have 22.5 over what? 10 million dollar bills. Now, if we do the conversion rate on that, let me, let me make, I had one of these tabs open too that uh, had the correct answer. Um, this is the kind, look, again, this is the kind of streaming content that's, you know, incredible. It does so well against Among Us. So, what's everyone getting? Hmm? What's everyone getting? I want to see if I can quickly look up wherever the heck my history is. I don't use Chrome because I don't trust it. What's everyone getting? Oh, I found it. Okay, so what was the answer to this? The answer... Okay, so this person put the bus at 10,000 pounds, just like I did. And... So what'd they get? Ten point three million. I got about ten million. What'd you guys get? Javad Crusoe, ten to the seven. That's ten million. That looks so uh Yeah, it looks like ten point three million or so is the correct answer. I think I did something backwards, but uh yeah. 10.3 million is what the answer got. I see answers of 11 million. We have Chris Sparks who donated 1 million pesos. So that's the way that's the way you do a Fermi estimation, right? So we we pick we we start from a place uh, of confidence and we make reasonable estimations, canceling out units that we want to know about to get to the correct answer. And that's what we did on the last episode of the facility that I'm about to show you. Somewhere. That's not that. Today's... <gasps> Ooh, look at this. In real time. Look at that. That's fun. A. <laughs> so on the last episode of the facility... Looking through some of your comments, Ryan M. said, I, whoever gets the best comment here, I'm making you an honor to remember the facility, all right? Ryan M. says, I love how the Drake equation, you guys can't see Ryan. I love how the Drake equation is simply a Fermi estimate jumbo-sized. Yes, the Fermi estimation 
the fur the 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 sorry the drake equation is just a fermi estimate you take how many stars in the galaxy how many stars in those galaxies have planets how many of those planets might be habitable for life how much of that life growing up on those habitable planets are going to achieve intelligence how much of those intelligent uh populations are going to achieve space travel that kind of thing that is just a that's a classic fermi estimation Jason Guppy says, as a middle school science teacher, I use Fermi estimates all the time to answer crazy questions for my students that I have no way of 100% correctly answering on the fly. Arreus3 says, uh, I said it wasn't cheating when you're Googling some numbers. So you're saying that I can just Google answers instead of using this, this method? instead of using this method, no. What Fermi estimations are really good for is for estimating stuff that no one has an answer to. Um, or answering something, and this is what Fermi did a lot, answering something that is so incredibly technical that it would take years for the smartest people on Earth to come up with the right answer, but you're getting within the ballpark of it very quickly on the back of an envelope. So the good example of this was you, as I said in the episode, ripping up pieces of paper, dropping it in front of the blast wave of the Trinity test, the first nuclear detonation, and estimating within a factor of two what the actual yield strength of that bomb was. It took weeks or months to actually calculate what it was, and he got within a factor of two in moments. That's why this is strong. When someone does a back of the envelope calculation, this is what they're doing. Josh the Weirdo says, when you said you stood next to a large dump truck before, is that because Aria is thick? Yes. <laughs> but I'm giving, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> Metal Kitty, if we were to do a Fermi estimate for the amount of donations Kyle gets per live stream, I'd say it's somewhere between, uh, $500 and $10,000. Bound the problem. But uh, for this peer review, I'm giving it to B Whoop, who says, Kyle, you are actually closer on the NBA question uh, if you're counting the points scored in a normal season. The last two seasons were shortened due to COVID, so the totals were lower. But 2018, 2019, there were about 275,000 points scored. I know the point is just getting close by Fermi, Fermi estimating. I don't like that. I do, actually. For misdemating. But gotta give you the credit you deserve, you total sports guy. Love the channel. Keep it up. Be whoop. Thank you so much for your comment. I didn't even know that because of outside factors like the pandemic, I got even closer in my estimate than I even thought was possible. And for that, you are now an honorary member of Facility Be Whoop. May I just say, whoop whoop. Fantastic. Kevin, you got his plaque, right? That's not a plaque. That's literally one of the darkest surfaces on the planet Earth that I'm going to make something out of. It's not a plaque. Kevin, we, we got to talk about your reading skills. No, it's not Vanna Black, actually. William Bauer, the 10, says, If humans managed to create true VR similar to the Matrix, do you think time in VR would move slower relative to your physical body? Could this be a potential way of increasing your perceived life? Um, to make your life feel like it's moving more slowly... I imagine that your brain would have to process information at a different rate. And so what the matrix is doing is just feeding you information. It's not determining how quickly your brain interprets that information, right? So, for example, the matrix may make it seem like your world is moving in slow motion, but you wouldn't feel 
slowed down, right? Um, that's a complicated question. I don't know. Off the top of my head, it doesn't feel like that's correct, but I don't know. Brian Murray with the 25 says, I'm back from the Vodlands. Would breathing for speedsters be different than for normal people? Like, would breathing be painful for someone traveling at those speeds? I'm going to go ahead and guess yes, absolutely. There, I I like the speedsters who wear, ma- like, the Flash or whoever. He doesn't do it, but... Um, characters that wear gas or respirators. Um, because have you ever leaned your head out of a window when you're on the highway in a car? Hopefully you're not driving. But if you put your face right into the wind, it blows your eyelids back, it gets in your mouth, um, it can make it hard to breathe. Now imagine you did the same thing, but you leaned out of a cruising 747 going 550 miles per hour. You could imagine that that effect of being difficult, hard on your face and your mouth and your breathing, would only be amplified. Now increase that effect for something like a speedster when they're not moving 500 miles an hour, but they're moving 5,000 miles per hour and the force of drag becomes such a problem that would probably rip your clothes right off. I'm going to go ahead and guess, yes, it would be very hard to move around, uh, to breathe when you're moving as fast as, as someone like the Flash does if you're not wearing something like a respirator. Inazuma Fool with the 20 says, Howdy, Kyle. Love the show. (laughs) Hey there. Quick correction. Since Roman, Romanian is a Latin-based language, and the U at the end of Dimitrescu is actually pronounced. It's verified by my, my Romanian co-workers. Um, I made a video about Resident Evil and Big Thick Vampire Mama. I had written it and pronounced it Lady Dimitrescu, according to what Romanian speech is like, I was corrected by Capcom themselves, the company, saying, no, it's, don't say it that way. Say it Dimitrescu. So don't blame me. It's not my fault. I did say Dimitrescu, and we had to go back into the video and re-record some stuff because they said, don't say it like that. And they were paying me, so what, you know, and it's their game. You know, they can do whatever they... Maybe it's a weird... I mean, it's a Romanian root, but, you know, it's a vampire weirdo. With a big... Maybe they... But I appreciate the cor- the correction, yes. In, in, in Romanian, it would be Dimitrescu. But again, not my fault. I know that. Don't blame your boy. Okay? Christopher Johnston said, How do skydivers breathe at 100... 80 miles an hour. First of all, um, human terminal velocity is like 120 miles an hour. Um, well, I guess if you're doing one of those pencil dives or something like that, but again, I think there's some labor involved with breathing while you're skydiving for one. And for two, again, we're not anywhere near the speed that speedsters go. I asked you to imagine something that was three times faster than that, like leaning out of an airplane. Now imagine 10 times faster than that. Imagine trying to breathe with air rushing into your face and into your lungs, uh, you know, a hundred times faster than a skydiver falls to earth. It sounds like something would, that'd be uh, difficult, right? Yes. Denerva 1G1 says the U in Dimitrescu might have been dropped as it may sound offensive in some languages and they wish to have good marketing penetration. I see what you did there. Don't do that. <laughs> A couple of you are getting your messages deleted about what you're saying about this character. I want you to know that. Okay, Anthony Robbins has an actual answer for us. Been skydiving, there's definitely effort involved in breathing. Yes, again, so if we are talking about breathing at the speed of the flash or the velocity of the flash without a mask on, without like a helmet on, it sounds like it would be a lot of effort. One of those small things you don't think about unless you're actually thinking about what you're trying to think about. William Bauer with the five says, follow up to my previous question. 
Would your brain be able to process things faster if not limited by a body? Um, processing speed in your brain is limited by how quickly electrical and chemical interactions happen between your neurons and the, and the synapses of your neurons. It's all limited by how quickly these chemicals can interact with each other and how quickly um, your axons and your neurons can transmit electrical signals um, across dendrites and blah, 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 blah. So I'm guessing, yes, if it was faster, if all of that was faster, then you would perceive, you might be perceiving time or your own time differently. Um, imagine if your brain worked as fast as a computer. Well, not my computer, because you've seen how bad it was today. But um, if you're doing trillions and trillions of operations per second, or whatever the number is, then... Yeah, I mean, it would seem like the amount of time it took for me to think about something might not be anywhere near the time it takes for you to think about something. But again, I don't know. I'm not a neuro... physiologist. In a Zuma Fool with a follow-up 20, no worries about the Capcom thing. I know Jeff Capcom had something to do with it. He did. I had a question, though. What would it feel like to get hit with a Kamehameha? Would it be a burn or an impact force? That's interesting, because what would be an energy blast in Stellar uh, Nebula says, how are you, Kyle? Eh, never that great. Um, what is a key blast in Dragon Ball Z or any of these anime shows? Um, people like Matt Pat have had ideas about this. I tend to agree that it's probably something like a plasma. And a plasma is a super hot gas, but it's not a super heated gas, more or less. Um, even though it's a different state of matter from gas, it's basically like super hot gas. Gas that's so hot that particles are moving around so quickly that electrons get ripped off from their atoms and molecules, and those electrons move around in this superheated gas, and such. Uh, they move around such that this gas can now conduct heat, uh, conduct electricity, and responds to electrical fields. It's a plasma for state of matter. But being a gas, it's very, very hot, but being a gas, it does not have a lot of mass. So to say that getting hit with a plasma would have a lot of impact force, probably not. It'd probably be like being hit by a laser beam, which is to say nothing. It would have to have a lot of mass behind it. And there's just not a lot of dent. The gas is not dense. Um, you know, the density of air is what? One kilogram per cubic meter? So you need a lot of gas in that small key area to hit you with any real impact force. Um, so without doing an entire thing on it, I'd say getting hit with a Kamehameha feel, probably feels less forceful than you imagine it to. But it, it's so hot, it could be millions of degrees or something like that. It could vaporize you outright, you know. So it doesn't have to hit you. It just has to damage you. And you do see that kind of thing, right? Mike, uh, Mike in the chat says, did someone super chat $1 million? Yes. I, uh, this chat, I did become a millionaire and this is the last office hours because I'm buying an island in, on Lake Michigan, in Lake Michigan with a boat, a cheap boat, pontoon boat, and lots of beer. Um, uh, okay. This was a, um. Look, I'm going to admit it. This wasn't my finest stream. Technical difficulties. I'm not on point. But I do like talking about bugs. And if you want to talk to me about everything under the sun, including bugs, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and join the facility today. Talk with me on Discord after this video is live. You can see uh, videos earlier than anyone else. You get behind-the-scenes photos. You take polls to help me with my titles and thumbnails and all this what and all this kind of stuff. Right now, uh, tomorrow, I'm going to ask all my facility staff members to vote on what they want us to do for a million subscribers. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week coming up this week on the facility. I'm not going to show you what I was doing in New York just yet, but we do have a another a new half-life history where yes as you've been asking we do return to chernobyl to explain just what the heck is going on at chernobyl today it turned out really well i hope you enjoy it um and as many of you were saying at the beginning of the stream 
I know I need to be streaming more and playing more science -y video games on Twitch. I'll try to do that this week if I don't not want to do it. I'm thinking Half-Life 2. I love that game. has so many great science -y things in it. It's on Steam. It'd be easy. But, like I said, have a wonderful rest of your week. And until then, be nice to each other, no matter who you are, where you're from, what you look like, when you were born, who you like. Because at the end of the day, this is all we got. And some of us are lucky enough to have super tiny coffee cups. <laughs>